welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about metals. I'm Jenna Mathiason, an object conservative based in Kimmarlandshire. And I'm Chloe Ramsey, an object conservative based in Greater Manchester. Hey guys. Hello. I sound like I'm in a tin, by the way. I apologise. No, it's more like a small cardboard box. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise for my audio quality. I forgot my laptop, so we're just on my phone because of the wonders of technology. Yes. Well, hey, now we're making it work. Don't be like that. <laughs> we're making it work and we're making it work. It's very worthwhile. And also somehow with metals conservation, as we're discussing, tin would be an ideal material that would fit into the episode, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Already topical. <laughs> I'm here for it. I love it. Should we get our guest host to introduce us? Yes, please. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Lucy Branch and I am a sculptural and architectural features conservator. And although I do all sorts of metals, uh, my favourite metal happens to be bronze. But it doesn't mean that I don't have to work on lots of other things because, you know, that's the nature of the field. So I love that you have a favourite metal. I mean, I knew that you yeah, did, I love it. but... I struggle to think what my favourite metal would be. Maybe gold, because I don't have to do much with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's so dull. You know, what, what kind of problems are you going to get with it? I mean, that's the beautiful thing. Like, it's mostly the problem with gold is it's a bit soft. So not try not to scratch it yet. <laughs> don't drop it. But like bronze does all these crazy things to people. I mean, I'm sure other metals would as well. But I get quite a lot of people having been injured with what? it. So It's bronze cursed. It's a really strange thing. Like, I get quite a lot of... One of the ones that we look after at Canary Wharf, people hit their head on it all the time and they have like quite bad oh cuts gosh. and injuries. It's not one of the it's not one of the staff. It's people walk into it. So it's clearly like they maybe they're looking at their phone or not watching out what they're doing. But then also I had a gentleman who kind of had his head split open <gasps> because uh, his statue fell on him from oh the gosh. top of the uh, shelves that it was on and sort of, yeah, oh kind of gosh. concussed him. And and I know that sounds like it could be like yeah. a murder plot, doesn't it? Like someone tried yeah. to kill him with his statue. How is this not in the Halloween episode? Oh, that's so random. Probably shouldn't have laughed at people bashing their heads, but I'm just... Well, no, no, it's, I hope everyone's okay. But I'm mildly entertained by the notion that maybe people aren't looking where they're going. <laughs> I know. And the thing is, then they blame the metal, the object as well, immediately. So they say, <laughs> oh, that shouldn't that shouldn't be there. And so what can we do to sort of prevent people being injured in future is so we have to like put huge flower beds around it and things. And you're like, no, just <laughs> look where you're going. You know, if if it doesn't apply to like, I don't know, a, a telegraph pole or something, you wouldn't go, oh, we better put a flower bed around that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I love this. I mean, this must be like a like some sort of public piece of art. I'm guessing that's yes. He's he's actually called. If you want to go and visit him, he's called uh, Man with Arms Open, oh. and so and he's kind of looking up to the sky. It's it's a really inspirational sculpture. I love it. Or maybe he looks like he's just about to give you a hug. Or whack you on like the head. <laughs> uh, yeah, or, or yeah, or attack you. Yeah, but I mean, he is quite sweet, and I think that it's quite a shame that all these people have like got bad associations with him because. They, they don't know where they're going. Okay, so bronze, slightly tricky. I like it. It's out to get you. Yeah. I like it. Have you ever been injured by bronze? <laughs> oh, me? Oh, many times. But usually it's something daft. You know, as most accidents happen, it's usually something daft that you've done, isn't it? Again, I can't really blame the bronze. <laughs> but quite often, I think the the hitting you, uh, the concussion part of it, especially when it's a large object, you forget where it is. And so, you know, you do when you're working on it, it's easy to stand up and wallop yourself or something like that. Oh, but, yeah. Um, totally done that. Yeah. But no, no, nothing. I haven't been poisoned or anything like that by, by a piece of bronze. I feel like I feel like you would have to try quite hard. Although I suppose some of the yeah. maybe some of the corrosion products might be poisonous. Yeah, I d they're not terrible in the grand scheme of things. Obviously, something like mm. lead has yeah. more issues with corrosion. So even pre pandemic, we obviously had to work always with masks because yeah. particularly when you're working large scale you're getting large quantities of dust and part of it will be the corrosion products that you might be thinning out uh, particularly mm. when you're working on disfiguration which you get a lot of uh, particularly on outdoor sculpture. I do feel like we're on a health and safety section but we're starting with health and safety as a topic aren't we? We sort of are now yeah. Yeah I think it's really good. 
what what else can we like what are metals other metals that you can be poisoned by because i'm thinking i mean are we going heavy metals probably not but i'm thinking copper kills things doesn't kill people but it it's you know not great for yeah. living things in general they put it in contraceptives and stuff mm, yeah that's true yeah plants yeah i don't like it But bizarrely, even though it is supposed to poison sort of plant life and things like that, bizarrely, there seems still quite a lot of mossy things that grow on bronze you come across and you would think they wouldn't, Mm. but they do. I was going to say copper tape is supposed to deter slugs. It doesn't, (laughs) uh, at least not. (laughs) No. At least not Welsh ones. They are big and slimy and they don't care. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a lot of metals in pigments that uh, you get things like antimony pigments Mm. and things like that, which we use quite a bit in conservation. Mm -hmm. And that's even going towards lead white. Oh, yeah. And um, the sort of lead corrosion products, which obviously is quite a lot of lead sculpture Mm. in the world Mm. and uh, beautiful historic lead items which bizarrely often can be coated as well so they don't look necessarily like lead until you oh that's sneaky yeah you they almost look like stone because they've been finished in such a way to imitate stone you do wonder why they didn't just make it in a stone yeah yeah so what's the while we're on the health and safety topic what's the problem with lead then what with lead corrosion what's it do I've, I've obviously written, re- read all of the health and safety things, but for the sake of this discussion, what's it doing? Why is it so bad compared to other things? Well, just how toxic it is. And so, mm. and unfortunately, the, the dominant um, lead corrosion product is white. And so often it's so contrasting in shade to the substrate that people often want to take it off and there's only so many ways of removing corrosion Mm. from features and you know the problems with things like gels and acids which does remove corrosion is that it also very often damages the surface at the same time because it just goes too far and so people like ourselves who want to be incredibly careful often might work by hand and use abrasion methods which are much easier to control if you're working by Mm. hand and very slowly but the only problem is that creates dust and when you inhale that you have uh, unfortunately a very toxic product in your body of course Mm. it's not great and and also you can get it on your hands just you know residues on your hands and you maybe lick your hand or put it in in your you know it's very easy you rub your eye or something yeah exactly Mm. rub your eye it's incredibly easy to end up absorbing it and a very little bit does you know quite a lot of damage so the last time I worked on a a lead project you know we all looked like we were dealing with Ebola you know (laughs) I mean really we looked ridiculously as crazy but you know you have to be so careful and it's just like actually we'd rather look really stupid than end up with Alzheimer's or or some you know long-term health issue which um, it might not necessarily be as acute as oh I'm poisoned the next day but actually long term it it Mm. stays in your body and it and it's nasty cumulative as well yeah absolutely if bronze goes after you surely a much more I was gonna say deadly metal would be uh, just iron anything with iron because surely that will have crushed many a person right like things we make a lot of things oh dropping on people yeah (laughs) we also make a lot of weapons out of iron (laughs) I mean not to trivialize it but it is you know in terms of things out to get you. The thing is that I suppose treatment wise, you have perhaps less issues in the sense that you're often dealing maybe with coatings on iron rather mm. than the iron. Um, there's always going to be rust issues, but with a say a bronze and often with a lead, you're working directly on the substrate or the associated surface so what I mean is a patinated surface is Mm. is actually part of the bronze itself it's just that that top surface has been colored a specific shade whereas with something like iron on an object an architectural feature for example if it's been outside and if it's decorative it tends to have paint layers so you might not be dealing necessarily with that lower level substrate but 
with the top surface. So, um, you know, unless you are, I suppose, having to chop it up and, you know, structurally mm. deal with it, which mm. none of us, none of us really have the appetite <laughs> to do. We don't want to chop, chop things up. Yeah. Other than for testing, I know that they do a lot of um, that sort of testing based stuff in uh, Cardiff university for their masters and stuff but I do sometimes have clients who say things like you know what's wrong with this object and basically the armature which very often was made in iron um Mm. you know sort of earlier objects and they have collapsed because maybe they've had Mm. water funneling inside them for a long time and the iron inside has collapsed and so the structural part of the object is no longer there and they're saying to me well, what can you do with it? And my answer is, well, actually, the only thing we can do if you t- is to open the object up and insert right. a new armature, obviously take out the, yeah. but I mean, that's how, I mean, it is horribly interventive, but then they kind of say, well, you know, isn't there another way of doing that? And I think, well, short of a magic <laughs> wand, <laughs> no, there really isn't because you know, if you're having to get inside an object, the only way of dealing with it is a horribly interventive way, which is, opening it up it's kind of ingrained in us not to do that kind of thing but sometimes it's just absolutely the only thing that can be done oh that's a wolverine level stuff that's insane i love it (laughs) that specific problem of metal being used as a significant primary component to an object you wouldn't need to take apart a doll with a metal armature in order to conserve it you would potentially look at the mounting of the object but that's because all the pieces yeah. around it are so much lighter. Whereas a sculpture with a metal armature, it can't hold itself up if it's not conserved. Exactly. You know, dealing with outdoor objects and indoor objects are wholly different fields in many ways. Mm. I was trying to differentiate what I do from work internally because you know you do look entirely differently at how Mm. to support something if it's in quite a cloistered environment I have to look at objects and think how if someone climbs that what are they going to do (laughs) yeah and yeah you know with a doll in a in a case hopefully if it's a precious thing no one's going to climb it right I I would hope so they're not (laughs) it's a very different consideration (laughs) Yeah. And unfortunately, things just don't that we don't have many options mounting wise externally, you know, apart from the traditional ways of mounting things. Mm. And generally, when there has what I've seen anyways, when there has been efforts to sort of go in that direction, unforeseen issues come up like um, they end up housing something maybe with a sort of plastic type supports and then they don't realize that actually they've created a microclimate Ooh, around yeah. the object which oh, has accelerated the corrosion which basically means that although they have structurally supported it they've ended up ruining what was the quite you know patina that was in quite nice condition previously mm. so then I've kind of been brought in and they say well you know what can we do we We thought we were doing a good thing, but actually what they've done is taken kind of museum conservation outdoors and it doesn't necessarily Uh, translate. Oh, yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's quite fun to think about because I I had a go at thinking of different types of, let's say, metal objects. And the list goes thusly. Archaeological, utilitarian, outdoors, huge bastards and (laughs) fancy (laughs) <laughs> but those are my broad categories and and lucy you deal with outdoors and huge bastards yeah. sort of i think i'm the like the only person in the world that loves like super narrow niches like i, I like <laughs> also objects that can't be moved like i like oh. those objects one of the reasons i like bronze is obviously there's there's so many beautiful things made in bronze but the, they put them in all sorts of locations sculpture particularly and architectural features and I really like coming to an object and thinking okay how do I treat this here not Mm -hmm. you know not you know I would have been bored years ago if I um, was just sort of dealing with objects in one location because you know there's quite maybe a, a relatively few number of treatments you can do but having been, you know, working in this field forever and ever and ever, every single time I come to a new location, I have to adapt the treatment somehow because it just isn't suitable in 
that location. And so it yeah. keeps it much more interesting, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so is that treatment for, as in the work that you can physically carry out in a space, or is it treatment for what the object requires for that space? Often I'm more dealing with, is it a preventive treatment or is it something like a restoration treatment? Mm -hmm. And um, that's generally what dictates, you know, what's necessary to do. But for example, it might be absolutely seem like the right thing to do to maybe use a protective coating like Incrilac on an object because it can really work well. But if that object is low down, it's completely ruled out because the amount of kicking, touching, splashing, scratching Uh. that will take place on an incrilac surface will mean that it will look dreadful in no time. Uh. But put that same object, you know, above two metres and you may get 20 years at least of lifespan out of it. So it's the physical contact with the coating Mm. that determines whether it's, it's actually applicable in that scenario. It doesn't mean that that treatment isn't fabulous in some scenarios, but it just is awful in others Mm. I quite like the problem solving of it like how do I do this on the top of a roof you know (laughs) you know it's difficult because loads you know say you think oh well it's really easy you've got like pressurized I don't know you'd be thinking of something like um, a wet abrasion system which works brilliantly maybe on the floor and will only take you you know a day of work to do but take that hundreds of feet up in the air and you've got no pressure because you can't get (laughs) you know anything to get that pressure up Mm. there so you know then you start you know looking much more at traditional hand hundreds of year old techniques oh that is fascinating it's a good point I sort of hadn't considered that you sometimes work at considerable height (laughs) oh yeah I mean I've I've worked on things that move as well I know I know this is not a dynamic object topic but like we did work on one which was a sort of wand that basically moved back and forward and every time uh, that you couldn't hold it still because if you did if the wind hit it in a certain way it would snap what? they the engineers said yeah so basically we had to wait for the trip for the wand to waft past us and just you know spray down with it as it went past and then you know wait another 10 minutes until it came back again <laughs> It, it did only have a, a particular trajectory, so we could plan that we wouldn't be hit by it. Okay, but, that's um, something. Yeah. That is crazy. I love that. <laughs> so when you said big bastards, Jenny, I thought you meant like SS Great Britain or something. But actually, we're talking about things that are swinging, like literally swinging. Not only can you not move them, but you cannot prevent them to move, <laughs> stop them moving. <laughs> I mean, I think in my mind when I said that, I think I I meant, yeah, like, yeah, like a piece of a bridge or, yeah. I don't know, a, a giant piece of industrial equipment that cannot be moved, like something to do with mining that's outside mm. forever because yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, it's yeah. built. You know, I, I sort of considered that to be un- under the category of big bastards. I'm sorry, everyone who loves those things. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I, I also love and appreciate those things, but they are still huge. They are vast, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I, I was just thinking of that as a category of like really, really big things that are just immense, like bigger than I want to think about. I mean, I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of our work with those ones, if we're in a museum setting and there's, say, a museum sculpture or something outside it, I feel like at the moment, a lot of the dealings that we've you know, people listening to this might have with that sort of thing is, you know, maintaining the coating. So it's been there for 30 years or something, just guessing. Oh, yeah. And so now it's, you know, you're just looking at the coating going, oh, God, that needs to be redone. Or when is it going to need to be redone or something? Yeah. If you're a conservator and you're overseeing, say, an installation of a large metal sculpture outside your museum, well, how long would you have before you have to start thinking of a conservation coating? Right. OK, so this is the million dollar question (laughs) so if we're are we talking about traditional sculpture here maybe a traditional bronze feature uh, outside of a museum yes something like that really you need to be thinking about a traditional wax-based coating mostly I would say Mm. and the reason I say that is because if you are trying to treat something that is um outdoors with 
a coating that will last a lot longer. So say you might be thinking about something like Incrilac, if you're thinking about something that you're wanting to get longevity out of. The problem is that spraying something like that in situ in our base is a complete nightmare because of all the dust that's in the air mm. and because of mm. the you know terrible uh, weather that variate every day in the UK. And so to get a really sound coating, that has to be done internally. Uh, and so something like that, if it's a historic feature, I would say a wax coating is your best option. Now, waxes, the research shows that they don't last that long, frankly. And I think the most that you see waxes really lasting for is about a year. And oh, oh, wow. So the thing is that, and that's not even, it might only, it might be less than that. So basically what happens is you get a prevailing wind and in that direction, the wax oh. fails much quicker than it did on the other yeah. side, which is quite sheltered. So the problem is that, yes, it seems like, oh my goodness, a year, we're going to have to retreat that. That's dreadful. But the difference is with something like a wax coating, which is a traditional coating for sculpture, is that it's super easy to apply and quite quick. So mm. you can quite quickly clean down a surface, make sure there's no dirt and grime and reapply the coating. And so in terms of expense, it's not that much. Now mm. you get something like uh, an Incrilac coating, which has got some very good qualities to it. And the, the reasons that we use Incrilac on something like sculpture is because it's so much more easy to reverse than the traditionally much harder lacquers. So, mm. uh, you know, you, you don't want to be really attacking your surface to get a coating off and you don't want to be using vats and vats of really yucky solvents to get a coating off. And that's what you have to do with some of the harder coatings. So Incrilac is a great product, but the problem is once it goes, my goodness, it goes and some. And so it's expensive to take off if it fails. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a risk factor there that what happens with lacquer is very often you get something like guano, hit it, and you get a little 10 pence piece that suddenly fails. And then it fails from that point outwards. It's a bit like a, um, a glass that's shattered or a oh, mirror wow. that's oh, wow. shattered. It starts to move down the sculpture and suddenly it looks super bad. And, so, and then you have this really big bill to put it right. And so, you know, that might not happen, but it is a substantial risk when you've got birds all over the mm. place. Yeah. And so then it's it it might seem my goodness a year having to treat this object every mm. year is a terrible expense but actually it will generally speaking keep it looking good and although we can never put something like a traditional bronze in stasis outdoors we because of the environment we definitely can slow its degradation down quite significantly mm. and so it kind of it's a tried and tested method but it really works and some of the more longer life coatings just cause as many problems as they solve do you just reapply the coatings then if you're if you've got a bta do you have to remove it all and then reapply a fresh one yeah, you have to remove the entire coating because it is a lacquer coating. Mm. Uh, you you know, the problem is you can think to yourself, oh, well, I will just, you know, cut down that little area and yeah. reapply it. But what happens <laughs> is it, it ends up looking like a patchwork quilt. Yeah. And you start, see, you know, you get down, you think, oh, I've done that. It's really nice. And like two weeks later, you're like, there's another patch. So if we move inside a space now, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of, the logical next step because it, first we're talking about environments that are completely uncontrollable and that's the yeah. joy of them you can also entirely control an environment and I'm thinking of, at the moment I'm thinking of the example of the SS Great Britain with the with the vents and stuff oh my god yeah yeah m maritime material mm. is always going to have an extra hard time yeah. with all that stuff so <laughs> that's, that's you know <laughs> Bonus points for uh, difficulty. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. the yeah. thing is that the thing is with metals is it sounds so simple to stop them changing and and corroding. Mm. Basically, yeah. don't have any water and and take out the oxygen. Ideally, have nothing at yeah. all. 
super easy. That's fine. When I say that to people, I say, well, you know, if basically if you don't have any moisture at all, you know, it's fine, but it's really hard to do. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, almost impossible, even in indoors. It's really hard. People don't realize how much fluctuation in RH there yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. yeah. And again, inside people think, oh, well, it's really clean. It's so not. It's really <laughs> dirty inside <laughs> as well. And these contaminants, you know, they are the sources of sort of, they are the things that are reacting with the metal surfaces and the more decorative or more reactive metals are going to really change even in even interior if they have fluctuating RH. So if anyone out there, which I would assume is quite a few of you, have silver jewellery and it's just been out on a I don't know, a counter or a table or like you have it hanging out in, in maybe in your bedroom or I don't know. Something. I'm looking at some now. That's enough air exposure that it tarnishes. That's just it sitting there yeah. that, and that's in your house. That's like a domestic setting. You know, it's crazy to think how easily things do actually tarnish or, or, or corrode. I'm sort of enjoying that corrosion is really just how metals react to anything at all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm quite often asked these days, uh, sort of fine coatings, you know, that cure and don't have any off-gassing, prevent the off-gassing of the material below them because maybe they're in contact with bronze. Ah, oh, that's interesting. The the reality is they're re- the polymer sector is, you know, huge. There's still very few things that actually are really good at doing that. I mean, very few. If we're going to invest our money somewhere, I reckon that's a field for the future because, <laughs> you know, it's just under, it's underdeveloped and it's so needed. It could definitely help museum conservation, I think. Yeah. All right, big spenders, you know what to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thinking about treatments, I like that we've talked about coating things because that's usually a big yeah. one. I suppose other things that we can do is ways of cleaning things, which will vary wildly between metals. <laughs> yeah. And obviously what you're trying to clean off. I mean, the term cleaning for metals, I think, is a real red herring as well, oh. because, you know, very often people say, oh, can you come and clean this? And I think to myself, well, you can clean off the dirt or the guano, but you can't clean off the corrosion. Corrosion is, no. it's a reaction that stems from the substrate. And also many of those metals will have an intended finish. And so the idea of cleaning it off means you are destroying whatever originally was there in the first place or evidence mm. of anything that was originally there. And and also it's, but somehow it suggests it's a really easy thing to do, cleaning. I'm just going <laughs> yeah. to clean that and it will all be fine. And <laughs> Actually, removing corrosion is incredibly difficult and you have mm. to really think carefully about whether you should be doing it, why, yeah. how you're going to do it, you know, whether actually you know enough about the object. Because the thing with metals is often they've changed so much, there is no reference point of what they should have looked like. And so, you know, are you making an assumption that this is what that object looked like and therefore cleaning the corrosion off and maybe recolouring, repatinating the surface. or And that's where I think, particularly in the older days, there was an awful lot of mistakes made with objects. And we're looking mm. at metal surfaces now and assuming that might have been the original. And it, it mm. really wasn't. It's someone's interpretation of what they thought it was. And they didn't check. But I think that's happened in all sorts of fields of conservation and restoration. But I think very often done with bronzes because it people go oh we need it cleaning you know that makes me think of a couple of articles i saw ages ago now but basically where people were like why are these you know beautiful ironwork railings such garish colors <laughs> and it's like well those were actually the original colors we've we know that because we have evidence for yeah. it and we've actually brought it back to that you think they they should be black because that's how they are in your head yeah. or you've seen a lot of black railings but actually that isn't at all the original color scheme of this street at all for example and i just think that sort of stuff is super interesting that it's a lot about public public perception sometimes and people thinking it should be a certain way when actually that might not be what the evidence says. Yeah. And also, you know, our taste in the era we're living in is not necessarily the same taste that was a hundred years ago or, you know, 200 years ago. And so to yeah. us, it looks garish, but 
doesn't mean that that's the the opinion of those who made it and and what society sort of thought of it at that time and for custodians they find it very hard to think like that you know they're they're often quite saying oh I don't know if we should do that I don't know if we should do that and I'm thinking well maybe not but this is not authentic either whatever you're doing Mm. it's not going to be authentic yeah so with corrosion removal what and I'm thinking in all scenarios so museums outdoors you know utilitarian objects everything there's corrosion that we've talked about that one should keep in place that forms a protective coating but also corrosion that is damaging and highly acidic which ones should we remove and which ones should we keep in place um so (laughs) on something like a bronze there is no such thing as uh, a completely protective uh, corrosion product Uh, Mm -hmm. You have moisture and pollutants can still sink through the corrosion Mm -hmm. layers and continue to corrode the surface. Mm -hmm. So you can get many layers of corrosion and they sort of sandwich the surface so that less moisture gets in and pollutants but and that slows the rate of activity down but it doesn't it isn't like a passivating layer like Mm. if you think about aluminium oxide I was thinking of aluminium yeah yeah exactly Mm. that is a um that is a different thing uh, a different animal then you've got the fact that some corrosion products are active rather than passive. Mm-hmm. And when we talk about active corrosion, that's where you're seeing rapid change. And usually that comes from a place of something like chlorides. So we were talking about, you know, marine environments, but there's plenty of environments mm-hmm. where chlorides pop up. Um, and even with bronzes, they are intentionally patinated with chlorides. But when those chlorides age and start to to react with their environments, they become active. And so you can actually get sort of active corrosion, pitting and things like that, that is happening from kind of the inside out. Oh my gosh. It's never good. (laughs) No, that doesn't sound good. (laughs) But also you have to be really careful with lots of metals, but particularly bronzes that you are understanding what you are seeing because that term corrosion, uh, another word for it would be patina. Mm. But there are different types. There's the original patina, which means the intended patina. But there's also the naturally occurring patina, which tends to be what happens with a a bronze, particularly as it has reacted with its environment. So essentially, naturally occurring patina is corrosion. But it tends to be the type of word that's used when people like the way it looks. So corrosion starts getting thrown around when people notice that it's actually quite ugly. They say, oh, there's corrosion (laughs) disfiguring my statue. But actually, if you took it back two years, they really liked the surface, but it wasn't what the original surface looked like. It had just matured and they liked the way it matured. So it's a kind of Mm. language aspect and you have to make sure that you're not sort of identifying the naturally occurring patina as necessarily being the original patina. And, you know, it's not so much that you don't value both. It's just that you have to make sure you know what people know what they're looking at. Mm, interesting. I I once got in trouble. I'm sure I've said this before. I'm, I once got in trouble for emailing myself some photos of <laughs> of some bronze corrosion oh, yes. because yeah, I think I have mentioned yeah. this before. But but essentially, the statue was of a naked man, and let's just say that the email filters didn't really like me emailing my work account um, some pictures of a naked man, even though it was obviously not <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a uh, let's say real mm. naked man I mean um, but also he had very specific corrosion problems as in it was all centred around his private parts that's that's quite something I mean it was a very fun condition report to write <laughs> I have to say and also a really fun email to write to IT Do you know it's really really common that active corrosion happens in the nether regions I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to call them the nether regions it's really <laughs> really common so you see a lot of horses on plinths Oh my goodness, 99% of the time, all the active corrosion is around their areas. Outrageous. Why? I did um, Freud and um, you can imagine Freud right oh outside. My um, the, <laughs> oh my, the amount of time I spent with my head in his groin. I mean, it was just <laughs> unbelievable. And I had so many no. social media photos taken of that. And I'm sure I'm all over the Amazing. internet looking extremely uh, dodgy is the word. <laughs> 
That is amazing. But um, I think it's to do with the way that the air flows over the region. I um, It's active corrosion <laughs> is particularly worse with certain types of air currents that and the way that oh. water runs. You know, they tend to have lots of shapely sculpting in those areas <laughs> and the water tends to sort of hang around in that region more because it's it and not evaporate so quickly yeah so oh, that's and, interesting. The, and because it's maybe a little bit more protected you know the way that the body is around it mm-hmm. I think it stays damp longer and you get some quite mm. m- minimal air current and I think that that it makes it worse and it's very <laughs> common I didn't think that we would be talking about sculptures having VDs, but yeah. here we are. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, and lots of sort of, you know, having to do sort of assessments in <laughs> very dodgy areas of the <laughs> position. Amazing. Yeah. Because this was an indoor sculpture. So initially, my, like my thought was, is it just that people have touched it there? Yeah, like, that's what I assumed. Yeah, very often it's the sculpture. It's groping the statue. But it, Exactly. Very often. I mean, indoors, nearly always, it's it's sweat from the hands. It's lovely. <laughs> Humours are so lovely. I love that people <laughs> don't think that no anyone will notice. They say, I'm going to just, I'm just, no one's looking. I'm just going to, I'm just going to touch it. And then over time. Always evidence. We know what you did. Yeah. We probably can't pick up the fingerprint. <laughs> Except on some surfaces where we definitely can. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the evidence is etched <laughs> in place. Indeed. <laughs> oh, anyway, that was my anecdote of uh, naughty corrosion products. <laughs> I apologize for uh, lowering the tone, everyone. The other source of chlorides with bronzes is very often the core. So you get in lots of historic castings, even in contemporary castings, you get all sorts of grog and rubbish inside the core. And although when they're casting, they're supposed to rod out all of the areas, the areas that are sort of uh, difficult to get at, so things like elbows, I imagine the nether regions are hard to get at Um, and, you know, sort of awkwardly shaped bits. It's really hard to get that internal casting Mm. material out Um. because, I mean, you can imagine how do you, you know, once it's actually there, you haven't got a big hole to jet blast, like to blast out. You can blast anything off the surface, but you can't blast it out from the inside. And so what often happens is you get these tiny casting flaws and then the, the chlorides, which, because I mean, plaster very often used in casting and ceramics bits and depends what type, how old the casting was, but yeah. particularly something like plaster and things as, you know, you get all sorts of chloride and kind of contaminants mixed in there. And then they leach a little bit of it leaches out through the tiny casting holes and starts up active corrosion. Ah. And so that's also a possibility. Oh, I quite like that. That's a clue to how it was made as well. That's so fun. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the thing is that I've seen it on contemporary sculpture as I mean, it it can be really aggressive. So it can actually cause a huge hole in the sculpture and it eats its way out. And suddenly you see this, I mean, violent active corrosion on the outside. And you think, how on earth has that happened? And it's actually burned a hole in the surface of the bronze and literally eaten its way out like an alien. Wow, that is extremely <laughs> unpleasant. I, I love it. I know. I know. I mean, it's it's just such a cool metal. I mean, you know, you know <laughs> the, the reason that I, I don't quite as much about other metals is because they're not, they don't have as many problems. They're more well behaved. They are more well behaved. <laughs> I think we should do this as metals part one and have this as large and out and outdoor metals. Yeah. Out of curiosity, and this is something that, because I, I, I don't work with like huge, huge metals. Do you ever have to reshape anything or anything like that in your line of work? Give me a bit more context. Do you mean reshape it because of damage or do you mean? I was thinking damage. Yeah. So basically we've had a few statues that have been run over. So oh God, wait, well, what? Yeah. By what? Like a tank? <laughs> I think it was, I can't remember the artist, but very famous. It was something very significant had been stolen. And then as they were. Oh, yes, I remember this. Leaving yes. and they were, you know, zooming across uh, the embankment. I think it was. They dropped it and an, oh. artic- and an articulated <gasps> lorry ran over it. So um, it came in like a pancake. Oh, and my you're gosh. Wow. There are moments where you think, 
is this worth conserving? Like maybe it's just like wow. we should recast one from one of the other existing pieces. But my, it was my father was still alive when uh, that happened, and he was an absolute genius, and he just incredibly patiently sort of teased it back out inch by inch. And I mean, it was incredible to watch. So you can, I mean, not so much we we don't really do so much of sort of pairing back, but sort of reshaping. Yeah, and. That's more like, you know, a sculpture, but we get quite a lot of asked quite a lot about people reversing into doors. Oh, uh, yeah. So that makes beautiful sense. historic doors and somebody reverses a lorry and they end up mm. with a big dent. Oh, yeah. The problem is that that with cast bronze, particularly, it's incredibly brittle. So you can't just get your mallet and whack it out because if you do that the chances are you will split it and it doesn't sound like you think how on earth what do you mean but it cast bronzes uh it's a crystalline structure yeah i was gonna say Mm -hmm. you you really can i've seen people whack it and then it ends up just in two pieces so i mean it's about incredible you know patience Can you apply heat and stuff? You can apply heat, yes. First of all, you have to decide whether you're going to necessarily sacrifice the patina as well. Uh, And if the patina is really beautiful and you really torch up the heat, you will seriously disfigure it. And so it's a kind of a balance between getting the metal a little bit more malleable, a little bit with cast. It doesn't go malleable the way it does with sheet metal, but basically, and also that thing of sort of not damaging what you've got there already, which is in, in, you know, it may have been run over, but the pattern may be beautiful still. (laughs) So yeah, you know, it's really hard. Whenever things like that come up, I kind of, you know, take a deep breath and think, oh, I'm, you know, my heart sinks a little bit because there isn't much you can do. Oh, I know. (laughs) I mean, ultimately, that's the case with any type of conservation. Sometimes the patient is just dead. And yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've got to say there's nothing we can do here, which yeah. is sad. And thankfully, it doesn't happen that often. But sometimes we, we, we just got to call it. So what about large metal objects that have multiple different types of metal oh, God. within them? The thing that jumped into my mind was linotype machines. Ooh. Okay. Linotype casting machines. I haven't spent any time thinking about what they might be made up of, but it makes sense that it's more than one metal. Yeah, I haven't worked on anything of that ilk, but um, the big problems that I come across is bimetallic corrosion. So lots of um, galvanic corrosion, essentially, which is different types of metals against Mm. each other's surface, add in a bit of moisture and you get a huge activity, you know, from one of the metals. And that corrode those corrosion products that can form through that end up then disfiguring like the surface of the rest of the object Mm. and also structurally can affect the object because it weakens Uh, when you get so much corrosion it weakens the structure of the of the metal and Mm. so I can imagine that the kind of machines you're referring to might have similar issues. To be honest the machines that I've worked with that are the like giant linotype machines okay. I didn't see any corrosion on them but I just thought huh I bet that's a nightmare it's it's more the sort of huge complexity of those and, and if you're saying that you know any of those if each interface has the potential yeah. to be a huge problem just by changing the environmental conditions yeah. that's, that's crazy I'd be really interested to hear if anyone has been responsible for something like this I mean, you would hope that whoever made it did know enough about the materials that they were using to try to minimise, because otherwise they wouldn't sell many machines, would they? Because machines yeah, need a machines need Good a point. lot of maintenance. They, you know, if they're if they're working things, yeah, mm. they they will be quite hardy in a way, much like uh, I suppose. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of stuff that might be at the science museum, you know, like you know, yeah. aircraft and uh, space shuttles and stuff. Th- yeah. Those have been really stress tested materials that will have their own problems, but they they will be very different from, say, the problems that we might find it more in an art sector. That's true. Yeah, you don't tend to get sort of new, very many new linotype machines. Do you? They're usually like, oh yeah, I've been using this technology for thirty years. I mean, there might be experiments with, you know, like a new alloy or a slightly different uh, ratio in an alloy or even batch differences, you know, from depending on how these things are made. And it's more that I think in art, you're a lot more experimental, I would 
I, I dare say. And and mm, even yeah. with something, you know, as tried and tested as, hey, bronze has been around for a while, guys, th- th- there will still be, um, <laughs> you know, big differences between different studios or, uh, you know, different artists working with, mm-hmm. with different types of, um, you know, casting and all sorts of things. So I feel like there's definitely scope there for there to be m- not more problems because that sounds really negative, but more interesting issues. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, though, that, you know, bronze isn't one thing. It's a generic term for a copper alloy and there are zillions of copper alloys. Yeah. And I mean, even talking about new alloys that even with I getting a lot at the moment of aluminium bronze everywhere it's a real oh. buzz buzzword everyone loves oh. aluminium bronze and oh. it sounds why what why is it good so <laughs> or bad they say oh aluminium bronze it doesn't corrode mm, doubt well let me oh. tell you what they've done is when they've done their research and testing they've done things like you know they've used it on like oil rigs where it doesn't corrode oh. In to the extent that, oh. you know, it isn't going to cause a structural failure in terms of its corrosion. Yeah. Let me tell you, there's copper in it. And so in terms of aesthetic, it's just as mm. unstable as most other bronzes. It's, yeah. It reacts to the copper in it, reacts to its environment. And so I had a particularly sad situation where, you know, an artist nearly on their knees weeping because their statue is completely unstable in, in the finish that they wanted, which was quite an unstable finish anyway. But still, they'd been told and they'd done huge amounts of research and they had been told it doesn't corrode. It's just it means something different yeah. in like on an oil rig mm, in a yeah. marine environment than it does in an urban space when you're trying to keep a colour that is very, yeah. very specific. Um, and like, so like, as you say, an art context is wholly different from, you know, an engineering context. Yeah, it's, oh, it's interesting. And I mean, again, we're sort of back to aesthetics really which is a big thing with metals really yeah it's a dilemma with metals of all shapes and sizes really which is interesting yeah and i mean you are in a situation i I think maybe that's mostly important in a contemporary bronze context and also Mm. with memorial objects where yeah they have to reflect you know i've just had remembrance day they have to reflect the care that the community has for that object they Mm. don't want to see it looking like it's never been done uh, and never looked after and cared for but One of the things I think probably just to mention before we leave off is just, you know, why there are not a more diverse range of metal sculptures and architectural features, why bronze dominates so much. Because although we have obviously um, large steel, well, it's seen more now than it used to be and things like that. The reason that bronze does so well and has been used historically so much is because of these beautiful finishes that it can achieve and how generally speaking well it does the reason that iron doesn't do very well outside is because it has to have its coating in place perfect all the time otherwise obviously there's a level of Mm -hmm. degradation lead you know unfortunately uh you know, we know the the hazards of lead and and so you know there aren't that many types of metal that are suitable for large-scale art or large-scale architectural features that can give a decorative finish. That's why we love bronze. (laughs) And as you may have noticed, that became part one of Metals. So if you would like to co-host an episode about Metals part two, smaller metals, maybe indoor metals or ones you find in the ground, then you are very welcome uh, to express your interest and we look forward to hearing from you. Dear Jane, I have tattoos, blue hair and dress quirky. This is a way of showing my real self, but it can be confronting at times. How can I be my authentic self within the sector while still being able to gain employment in a mostly conservative male-driven environment? Signed, K. Dear K. Thank you for your question. And what an interesting question this one is. And what a dilemma you present. It's interesting that when Jenny sent, looked at the email, she said, well, we definitely need more people with blue hair in the sector. So I think the first thing I would address was your last point was a conservative male-driven environment. 
I'm not sure that all of conservation is a conservative male-driven environment. <clears throat> in fact, I think I'd go as far as to disagree that that's the case. I think there are parts of the heritage sector that are conservative and male-driven, particularly museums and classes of museums. But I would say that in my experience, conservation has been a relatively broad church and pretty open. I can't say that that, um, that that will hold true for everyone in every presentation. But I would say feel a little bit more confident of, of your sector and feel a little bit more confident that we're prepared to accept difference. Now, our sector is meant to, to serve the whole of community, the whole of society. And it doesn't. It's well documented and well discussed on the sea world that it's far too white and middle class and cardigan wearing and, you know, nice and a little bit quiet and a little bit behind the scenes. Those things are absolutely fine for someone to be, but that doesn't have to be the single existence. So I think that for you to find a job and keep a job, you have to present in that job as your authentic you. I think the people spot and are very attuned to people being inauthentic. So I would say that you have to look for a job or a role where you can present as you wish. Does that mean I would wear a backless dress so that they could see every tattoo or what? I don't know where your tattoos are. But yeah, you know what I mean? At the job interview? Probably not. I'd still wear job interview kind of clothes, you know, the kind of clothes that other people wear. That's what I would do because in my experience, people judge you very quickly and what you want to do is give them a chance to hear who you are and what you have to say and what you have to offer. So it would be nice if they hadn't already gone off you by the time you came through the door. And that's what I made my decision when I was a lot younger to, you know, cut the mop of purple hair and go for the bum bob when I was job hunting. Now, does that mean it was right? I don't think my experience is in any way necessarily right. It's just what I did. And I think that's the compromise I was prepared to make because, you know, I had to I had to pay the bills, <laughs> I had to get a job. Um, and I thought that that was needed. Time has moved on from then, but I think there is still a pressure to do it. So I think you should look for a role where you can be your authentic self. I truly hope that, that can be within the cultural and heritage sector. I think that that might involve you being more broad in what jobs you look for. I'm not quite sure what conservation jobs you are looking for, but you should be able to find somewhere. And I think that the sector is trying to present themselves as more diverse, as more inclusive, as speaking to more people in society. So I think that on balance, the majority of places would welcome you. I am making the assumption that you are in the UK or looking for jobs in the UK here. I don't know enough about the rest of the world, for which I apologise. I think that is still holds true in other places, although some European countries, you, what you will find is it's more about a career path. You get the right qualifications and you apply for the job and it's very much more an on-paper exercise. So if you are in those situations, then I imagine you'll get a lot further just by showing your paper qualifications. So would I tone it down a bit for an interview? If I'm honest, I have and I did. Would I recommend that you did? I think you've got to stay within the boundaries of what you feel comfortable with. I'd probably suggest that you go at the, um, the more toned down end of your boundaries, but I wouldn't go further below that because if you get a job and you're not you, you won't be happy in that job. If you find the sector can't tolerate you, which absolutely breaks my heart to think of, then maybe we don't deserve you. So... I think I'm plumping. I'd love to hear what other people think. I would plumping for stick to within the boundaries of what you feel comfortable with, but possibly on first presentation, go in at the, uh, the, the easier to digest version. The last thing I just want to pick up on is this idea of your um, appearance being conf confronting. I just want to challenge that as a concept, not that you're not reporting, because obviously if you say that your appearance is confronting, people have felt confronted. But in the end of the day, you have every right to be who you are and present however the heck you like and if someone feels confronted by that it really is on them so it's not you being confronting it is them being confronted it's them choosing to be upset by how you present I do feel that there's a distinction and perhaps that might help so that if you think of yourself as being whoever it is you you want to be and that that person feels confronted then I guess the question is do you want to work for or with someone who chooses to see your hair colour rather than your skill set. I think it would be a very frustrating and short term work relationship if you know they thought that you couldn't do conservation because you dyed your hair. 
So there we have it. That's my answer. I think this has been one of the most interesting and challenging questions I've ever had. And I'd love to hear what the rest of the listeners say. I um, hope that helps. Over now. Today I'm reviewing Modern Metals in Cultural Heritage, Understanding and Characterization by Virginia Costa. This is a Getty Conservation Institute publication from 2019. This book aims to fill a noticeable void in the conservator's bookshelf. Very few publications deal with what we might call modern metals, so the 20th century alloys that we now find in our collections. And this publication talks the reader through some of the hurdles of identifying those materials. Part 1 is a crash course in metallurgy and offers insights into the nature of metals, their overall properties, and how to tell them apart. The diagrams and tables here are very helpful, but the face diagrams are scary as hell. We get to acquaint ourselves with the concepts of alloys and how their structure differs from pure metals, how they're tested industrially, and how their corrosion works on a chemical level. The chapter on characterization is especially helpful to me as a general objects conservator, as I'm often left with only one option, visual inspection. Often this is lacking in literature on metals conservation, and I found this section super helpful. Of course, the chapter also covers analytical methods, but those are usually well beyond my reach, so this part is less helpful to me as a freelancer, or a small-time conservator, if you will. In part two, we dive into different alloys more specifically. Aluminium alloys, copper alloys, stainless steel titanium alloys, weathering steels, and alloys containing zinc. I liked a bit about likely applications and examples of what corrosion and degradation looks like for these different alloy types. To me, it's endlessly useful to know that a certain type of alloy might be more likely to be used in a certain type of industry, for example, as this helps narrow down my options when an object in front of me is simply labelled metal. I especially like that each chapter ends with a paragraph or two about the available conservation literature, though this is often disappointingly short. That's not Virginia's fault, of course. It just means there isn't much conservation research or many case studies to draw on. And it's in fact just a sign that we need to share more knowledge if we've got it. Some of the allied chapters are distressingly short, but again, this is due to the available data. Each chapter is very well researched, in fact, and comes with its own little bibliography. Part 3 is all about applied surface coatings and talks us through plating processes, hot dipping and conversion coatings. It's not a very long section of the book, but it gives you an idea of what sort of surface coating may have been applied to the object you're working on at the point of manufacture, and some ideas are a lot better than no idea. I like the reference tables and images of corrosion products in this book. They're not too scary and are easy to take in at a glance. The text itself is science dense and many parts can be intimidating if you're not a hardcore science fan, but it's definitely a useful book. The font choice is weirdly challenging, so funnily enough, most of my complaints are on the actual visual format of the book, not the quality of the content. That's actually top notch, if a bit heavy at times, no pun intended. Overall, definitely one to grab if you're likely to work on modern ish materials. This book costs $60 straight from the Getty website, or around £30 to £40 pounds on Amazon here in the UK. It has 136 pages with colour images throughout. If you're enjoying the C word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisement. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Thanks for listening. We're the C word, and you've been listening to Lucy Branch, Chloe Rumsey, and me, Jenna Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about rationalization and disposals. In the meantime, check out our website at thecword.show, tweet us at the C Word Podcast, 
or simply email us on the seaward podcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. And we don't have blood on our hands, I suppose, but... (laughs) Also dramatic, I love it. I know. (laughs) Uh, We don't have corrosion products on our hands. No. Um.